Now that we know what alcohols and ethers look like and how they behave, let's take a look at the sulfur analogs of those. They're called thiols and thioethers. When we have a uh, compound with an SH group, we call that a thiol. And when we have a sulfur with an R group on either side, uh, just like if this were an oxygen, we'd call that an ether. With the sulfur version, that we call that a thioether. And uh, if we take a look at some of their physical properties, the most notable thing about thiols and thioethers is their odor. So this molecule, this is called dimethyl sulfide, is a common name. <clears throat> and dimethyl sul sulfides are, are kind of an older name for thioethers. Dimethyl sulfide is the, one of the odors that, uh, molecules that give rise to the odor of cabbage when you cook it, that kind of foul odor rotten kind of smell um, is from cabbage, uh, is from dimethyl sulfide. The combination of these two molecules, these two thiols, are uh, primary constituents of skunk spray. And so uh, many of the foul orders that we, ha that we experience um, are, are going to be sulfur-related compounds, might be sulfur-related compounds. And we can take advantage of that fact when we look at this molecule. This is ethane thiol is the uh, IUPAC name for this molecule. Ethane thiol has a very distinct odor, very um, easy to detect in, in very, very small quantities. And so a use for this is it's added to natural gas. This is the odorant that is uh, added to methane, to natural gas. Natural gas is, is an odorless gas, but uh, that's very dangerous because we use that to heat our homes and so on. And so if, uh, if there were a leak in a pipe, we would not be able to detect that. So what's added to the natural gas uh, reserves are, is a little bit of ethane thiol. So if there's ever a leak of the methane um, mixture, we would be able to detect it. And so, you know, that's, that's a, felt, a smell that's familiar to us, but, and many people think that's what methane smells like, but in fact, it's a thiol that's been added to the methane. Uh, some of the reactions that they can undergo, one that's very special is that it can be oxidized very easily. Remember, oxidation is increasing the oxygen content. So we could use any good oxidizing agent like KMnO4 or hydrogen peroxide or sodium hypochlorite. This is bleach. This is the oxidant that's in bleach. And what happens is we increase our uh, number of SO bonds, and in fact, sulfur uh, can have more than eight electrons around it, so we can uh, even have this two, four, six bonds to sulfur. So really readily oxidize and put lots of oxygen on there. And these are things now that are going to be odorless. So this is very useful to us in case, uh, let's say we have a dog that gets sprayed by a skunk. How do you get rid of that odor? Well, you can treat, it, treat the dog with uh, peroxide or a dilute bleach solution. That's going to be very effective at getting rid of that sulfur smell. Another feature of thiols we want to consider is their acidity. Remember, if you have an OH group, like in an alcohol, you could deprotonate that, uh, making it a reasonable acid. The pKa of an alcohol is somewhere around 16. Well, the pKa of a thiol having an SH group is significantly lower. It's about a million times more acidic having a hydrogen on a sulfur than an oxygen. Uh, and so let's, let's take a quick look at why that is. And as usual, we need to consider the conjugate bases in order to explain that phenomenon. So if we were to deprotonate the thiol, we would end up with this S minus. And if we were to deprotonate the alcohol, we would end up with the alkoxide and O minus. We take a look at those conjugate bases and we try and find a difference in their stability. Now, what is the difference between oxygen and sulfur? Where are they located on the periodic table? Sulfur is actually right underneath oxygen in the periodic table, so they're in the same group, but it's, it's lower down. And as you know, as you move down a group in the periodic table, you get bigger and bigger and bigger. So sulfur is larger, and uh, it turns out that for the negative charge, that negative charge then has more surface area to be distributed on. Okay, so we could say since sulfur is larger, it better handles the negative charge. We could describe the extra electrons, the extra electron density being better delocalized over the large surface area. <clears throat> the S minus is more delocalized. 
And delocalization of a charge is always a good thing. We, maybe we could do it by resonance, maybe we could do it by inductive effects. Here's a case where we're seeing it by having a larger atom. Okay, so what does that do for us? If the, sulf if the negative charge on sulfur is, uh, is more stable, that means that this S minus is more stable. More stable means that it is less reactive and therefore the weaker conjugate base. This is a much weaker conjugate base and of course because it's a weaker conjugate base it has the stronger parent acid which was the thiol with the lower pK of, a ten, of about 10.5. Okay, so in comparing alcohols to thiols, it's important to know that thiols are more acidic. Um, and uh, so when we might have an application for this or need to know this is when we go to choose a base, let's say we wanted to deprotonate an alcohol. If we wanted to go from an alcohol to an alkoxide, what kind of base do we typically use to do that? We need a pretty strong base. We need something like uh, sodium hydride is a very good choice because it is an irreversible reaction or maybe sodium metal to do a redox reaction and, and form the alkoxide, okay? But we can't use something like hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is not an effective base to make an alkoxide because their pKs are too similar, okay? However, if we wanted to make uh, an S minus from a thiol from an SH, we could, use, we could use sodium hydroxide. That would be um, plenty basic enough and very readily completely deprotonate the SH to give us the S minus. Okay, let's see an example. How can we use this to make a thioether? Well, we could start off with a thiol, and if we were to treat this with sodium hydroxide, this is a base. This is a base, and the thiol is an acid. So what happens in this first step? We can deprotonate to make a completely deprotonate, so very little, if any, reverse reaction there. We could show that as a one-way direction, we can deprotonate, and um, this would give us an S minus. So an S minus would be a great nucleophile. In fact, not only because it's negative charge, but once again, because of its size, that makes it uh, polarizable. Those electrons can kind of stretch out and attack an electrophile. Uh, so that makes it an exceptionally good nucleophile. It's large and it's polarizable. And of course, it's negatively charged, so that makes it electron rich as well. So uh, it's a great nucleophile. So here in our second step, what are we adding? We're adding uh, benzyl chloride. And this would be a good electrophile. Anything with a leaving group looks like a good electrophile. So what's going to happen here? I think we're just going to attack the carbon, kick off the leaving group. What's that mechanism? Attack the carbon, kick off a leaving group. SN2, perfect SN2. Nucleophile loves to do SN2s. Um, it's you know it's it's not as strong a base as hydroxide, so we don't have that E2 competition uh, working with us, working against us. So we can work. We can uh, use this approach very nicely to add an alkyl group onto a to a thiol to make a thioether. So now we had one R group on the sulfur. Now we have two R groups on the sulfur, and we can make a thioether like this. <clears throat> so let's take a look at another example. If I asked you to synthesize the following target molecule, how would we make this? Well, we're going to use what we know about uh, regular ethers with oxygen and use that same approach. And remember, for a regular ether, the disconnection you make is on either side of the oxygen. And the same is true. Um, we can dis disconnect on either side of the sulfur. Those would be good disconnections. And uh, we want to make sure that the um, one of these carbons, let's take a look at the one on the right here and consider that as disconnection A, and then we'll compare the two after. For disconnection A, one of these, uh, we have a sulfur and a carbon that we're trying to bring together. One of them started out as a nucleophile, one of them started out as an electrophile. Okay, and anytime we see a heteroatom like a sulfur, oxygen, nitrogen, those are going to be naturally great nucleophiles. So I know this was my nucleophile. And this means that this carbon was my electrophile. So when I ask myself with my retrosynthesis, what starting materials do I need? 
I know that my uh, nucleophile is going to be the sulfur group. We can make that as an S minus. And uh, how do I turn this four carbon chain into an electrophile? I put on an alkyl group. Uh, I'm sorry, I put on a halide. Your choice, chloride, bromide, iodide, to make this alkyl group now partially positive, and this would be a good electrophile. So now I have a good nucleophile, and I have a good electrophile. Uh, let's take a look at disconnection B, and then we can compare the two. Disconnection B would be um, disconnecting on the other side of the thioether. And who would my nucleophile be in that case? Now this would be this four carbon chain with the sulfur. That would be my nucleophile. And what electrophile would it be reacting with? We need this one, two, three carbon chain and we want the middle carbon to be electrophilic, so what we do is we add on chloride, bromide, iodide, your choice, anyone you want, we can make the halide there. Okay, now normally what we would do is we would compare these, these two combinations and, and, and imagine them coming together and doing the reaction. What we want them to do is we want them to come together and do an SN2, and uh, we know that for backside attack, steric hindrance is very important, so we want to consider those. So in terms of steric hindrance, which of these syntheses um, would be better? Remember, it's the carbon bearing the leaving group that has to be approached from the backside. It's that carbon bearing the leaving group we want to be as unhindered as possible. So what we have in this first case, our electrophile has a leaving group on a primary carbon. This is a primary alcohol halide. And in the second one, we have a leaving group on a secondary carbon. This is a secondary alkyl halide. So which one is the better SN2? This top route, route A, is the better SN2. Okay, but guess what? Because uh, we're dealing with, a thi uh, with, with an S minus as our nucleophile, and this is a uh, weaker base compared to an alkoxide, <clears throat> Once again, because that sulfur is so large, the charge is delocalized, that makes them an excellent nucleophile and decreases its basicity. Uh, even on a secondary alkyl halide, this SN2 is okay as well. So in other words, there's going to be no E2 like we would have with RO-. Okay, so this is very much, if this seems familiar, it's because this is very much like the Williamson ether synthesis that we did. The Williamson ether synthesis is a way to make ordinary ethers, oxygen ethers, involves an alkyl halide and an alkoxide. An alkoxide and an alkyl halide gave an ether. So now we're using a sulfur minus and an alkyl halide uh, to, to give a, a thioether. Okay, and because sulfur is not as strong a base, we don't have to worry as much as we did about the um, uh, E2 occurring. So in this case, both of these answers would be acceptable, but let's go with the, the better SN2. This is a faster SN2. Um, it's going to be, uh, you know, maybe it's going to be higher yielding. The reaction is going to go faster. So let's do that synthesis instead. And how would we make this? Uh, it, how would we make this anion? We would start with a thiol, and then we would um, convert it to the S-. minus. That means we need to deprotonate it. So let's pick a base. You, you could use sodium hydride here, but you don't need to. And in general, we use the weakest uh, base we can because it's going to be easier to use, easier to handle, less expensive. So we, all we need is sodium hydroxide here that will deprotonate. And then what did we want to, uh, that made our nucleophile. Now we want to add in an appropriate electrophile. That's why we did our planning. We need N-butyl chloride or N-butyl bromide or something like that. And we would expect this to do the SN2 mechanism and give us our target molecule. So Williamson ether synthesis is going to work well uh, to make thioethers just like it did regular ethers. And let's look at one last example uh, because this is a pretty interesting reagent that we have, Na2S. Uh, we know each of these sodiums is positively charged, so what does this reagent give us? We have S. 2 minus as an anion. Now, once again, we've never seen that on an oxygen. That would be impossible with an oxygen, but because the sulfur is larger, it could accommodate those extra electrons, and it can have a, a negative 2 charge. So what do you think would happen with this reagent if we treat it with this dihalide? How do you think this reagent behaves? 
acid base electrophile nucleophile what do you think it does looks like a pretty good nucleophile to me pretty great nucleophile because it's uh, negatively charged so what are we going to do with it and, and here let's look at our Lewis structure we have two four six eight electrons but sulfur just like oxygen wants only six electrons so that's why we have our negative two charge and uh, with this alkyl halide, we certainly have an electrophile, so what I expect to happen is attack the carbon, kick off the leaving group. Now the sulfur has just three lone pairs and a bond. What kind of charge do we have there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Sulfur wants six, so this is still an S minus which means after it does this first SN2, it's still reactive, it's still a great nucleophile. And what do we have over here within the same molecule? We have an electrophile, we have an electrophilic carbon bearing a leaving group. And so what can happen is we can get an intramolecular SN2 to take place. So we kind of have a, a second SN2 here. What size ring would this form? One, two, three, four, five is a five-membered ring acceptable for doing an intramolecular backside attack it's very good five and six are both great so what we're going to form here just like we did we could make a cyclic ether by doing an intramolecular williamson we can make a, a cyclic thioether here we have a five um, membered ring this way so so the more you know about alcohols and ethers the easier it is to to think about thiols and thioethers because they do many of the same things that uh, oxygen does, but it's important to remember that the sulfur is larger, so it has some interesting consequences in terms of acidity and in terms of nucleophilicity. Thanks for